Okay, so while I'm waiting for them to get uh, my slides up, I'm Jacob Eisenstein. I'm a professor here at Georgia Tech. Um, this talk will be a little different, I guess, from the previous talks. I'm obviously speaking from um, an academic perspective. Um, I am not hiring. I do not care about your customers. Um, <laughs> um, what I do care about a lot is, uh, is natural language processing. And what I mean by natural language processing is taking text, taking speech, um, and converting that into some kind of uh, structured representation that then we can use for some kind of downstream computation. Um, I'm going to focus today on maybe a subset of natural language processing um, that I would maybe call machine reading, other people call machine reading, where we really focus on taking text and, and producing some kind of structured output. So I won't talk about text generation, also a very interesting problem. I won't talk about speech recognition. Um, but when we think about machine reading, and so here, the, what, you know, when I show a structured representation here, I'm showing kind of a representation of the, the syntactic structure of a sentence, the roles that different entities are playing in some kind of event. Um, this is something that, you know, really for the last couple of decades, we've taken a machine learning kind of approach. So we get some labeled data set. Um, People annotate that data set. Used to be linguists. Now it's like mechanical Turk workers. Annotate this data set. We train a system, build a model, apply the model to data that we have um, downstream. That's sort of the methodology that we've had. Um, the data set that I'm showing you here is a collection of newspapers. And I chose that example on purpose because that is indeed what the overwhelming majority of the data sets that we have um, in natural language processing are. Um, you know, we started doing this research in the 80s and 90s with labeled data sets like this. Um, that was the kind of text that was available. Um, the people that were sponsoring natural language processing research, mainly the DOD intelligence community, were especially interested in analyzing um, news text. So that's sort of the world that we were working in, um, in this kind of research. Um, of course, in the last decade, I think, you know, the really exciting development has been that the amount of text that's available in digital form and the diversity of text that's available in digital form um, has really exploded. So we're no longer interested just in building applications that relate to news text. We're interested in applications that relate to social media, of course, to um, corpora of scientific research articles, um, electronic health records, and so on. Um, but the labeled data that we have is still mainly newspapers. Um, and so that sort of poses a generalization problem. I think this really impeded the ability of natural language processing um, to, to, to make an impact in some of these other domains. Um, so to sort of just make this even maybe more um, sort of painfully obvious, the data that we were working with and that we have labeled data for, um, again, overwhelming majority is newspaper articles from the 1980s and 90s, um, typically the Wall Street Journal. So you, know, you have this sort of small professional cadre of writers. Um, they have editors that are like ruthlessly enforcing some kind of house style on the way that they write, and that's what text is from an NLP perspective. You know, we train a system on that, and now we want to apply that system um, to data that's really written by different people under very different conditions. And so, you know, the result of that is that performance gets much worse. So I'm collecting here three different results um, where you take a, a, a natural language processing system that you train on news text. Um, it gets high accuracy on news text. So, for example, part of speech tagging considered, uh, so this is the, the task of tagging a word as a noun or a verb or an adjective, considered almost a solved problem on news text, 97% accuracy. Um, apply that system to Twitter data, and the error rate increases by a factor of five, um, from 3% to 15%. And you see similar things down the NLP stack. Um, so, so why is this? Um, so it's, you know, it's one thing to say, well, you know, we have trouble generalizing from news text to other domains, of course. Um, but you know, intellectually, what is it about these other domains that make them so much uh, more difficult uh, or make it the case that, that we can't just apply these models directly um, to these domains? And I'll focus on two phenomena um, in the talk today. So the first is about uh, tacit assumptions about audience knowledge that writers will make in domains other than news text um, and how we can overcome that problem. Um, with machine learning systems. And the second is about language variation. So again, you know, I showed this collection of writers from the Wall Street Journal um, with a very rigorously enforced style of, of journalism. Um, you know, that sort of rigorous enforcement mechanism does not exist in social media or in other domains. Um, what can we do about that? Okay, so let's talk about this tacit assumption of audience knowledge problem. This is a real tweet. This guy is a, you see the blue check mark. So he's actually a journalist himself. 
Um, and he says, absolutely perfect response by the warriors. Um, a sort of classic information extraction problem is to take a, a sequence, a string of text like this, and say what entity is being referred to here. So the string, the warriors, refers to something, maybe an entity at a knowledge base. Um, what is this person talking about? And so, you know, you can go to Wikipedia and there's like a disambiguation page for the, the warriors. And so you, there are about 10 items. Um, there's this great like 1980 movie about like gangs in New York City. Um, there's the NBA basketball team. There's apparently a punk rock band. So these are all possible targets um, that, that you would link this, this string of text to. But we don't, you know, we, so, so he's able to write this because he can make this assumption that his audience knows which one of these things he's talking about, right? If he really thought it was confusing, uh, you know, he would have given more information, uh, but he didn't do that. Um, so, so can we sort of reconstruct the tacit knowledge that he's, he's assuming his audience has? Um, so one way to think about this is to think about um, writers and their readers, um, especially in social media, as embedded in some kind of social network, right? So there's a set of people that you know, there's a set of people that the author knows, um, there are connections between those people. Um, and one phenomenon that has been observed in all kinds of social networks uh, fairly robustly is this phenomenon of homophily. So birds of a feather flock together, that's the, the, um, the image. Um, but the idea is that this is maybe something that we could leverage here to help for this problem of missing context. So um, something about the, the position of this author in the social network makes it possible for him to use text in a way that, that you know, globally would be ambiguous, but in his corner of the social network is not ambiguous. Um, so we, we sort of test this idea um, mathematically by, by looking, when we, ha we have some label data where we know when entities are being referred to by different people on Twitter. Um, and we look to see whether people that are connected in this Twitter social network, and we have three kinds of Twitter social networks here, whether people that are connected in those networks um, tend to refer to the same entities. And so we find that in general they, they do. So there's, there's considerably, this is like a, a cosine similarity between the vectors of the um, entities that they refer to. So you know, more similar entities you refer to, higher the number would be. Um, and so for three different ways of constructing social networks on Twitter, you find that people that are connected um, really are more similar in terms of what they're talking about than, than, than random pairs of people in the same network. So we want to leverage this idea to actually build a system that solves this problem. And I'm going to give you sort of a, a walkthrough conceptually of how we do it, and then I'll, I'll give you like a couple slides of math about how the, the model actually works. Um, so imagine we go to the Twitter social network, we find people that follow this guy, this, um, this journalist, or, or maybe people that mention or retweet this guy. Um, and so we can look at where they are in the social network and what they do. Um, in particular, this guy Michael Lee here, I have a tweet from him, he says, the return of Clutch Dirk Nowitzki, blah, 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 NBA season. Um, so strong, strong clue here, right? Dirk Nowitzki, unlike the Warriors, Dirk Nowitzki is a totally unambiguous name, right? On Wikipedia, there's only one Dirk Nowitzki. Um, NBA is also a pretty strong sort of signal about the topic of, of, of what this guy is talking about. And so if we can somehow propagate that information back to our understanding of the original writer, that gives us a strong clue that his sort of mysterious reference is really about the basketball team. Why? Because the people that are connected to him in the social network are also interested in basketball. You can, I guess, tell that from the avatar image, but we don't do any computer, computer vision in this, in this research. Um, so, so what we're doing, um, and again, I'll give you sort of the math of this in another slide, but essentially we're going to embed everything into some kind of uh, vector space. So we're going to, you've heard of word representations like word to vec or skip grams. Um, you can embed words into some metric space, um, words that are semantically similar or near each other in this space. Well, we're going to take that same trick and apply it also to entities. So when I talk about the Golden State Warriors as an entity, I mean sort of the Wikipedia page, not the string Golden State Warriors, and, and also to, to nodes in a social network. So this writer, the people that this writer is, is friends with or is connected with in the network. I'm going to embed them all in a single social network um, such, that, such that inner products um, in this embedding space uh, represent similarity. And I'm going to look at inner products between things like entities and authors, and that'll help us solve the problem. Okay. So, um, I said there would be a little math, so um, essentially what we're trying to do is get a scoring function where um, we're going to score, um, so uh, x is going to be the text of like a tweet, y is going to be the assignments of substrings of that text to entities in a knowledge base, um, and u is going to represent the author. And so this scoring function decomposes, or we decompose it into two pieces. The first piece is sort of 
the state of the art before we did this research, so sort of a standard supervised learning system where I have features that describe you know, the entity in the text, um, and I get a score there. Um, and then the second piece is the piece that we're adding, and this is the sort of the, the embedding-based method that we're adding. I should say T here is an index um, because there can be multiple entities mentioned in the same, in the same tweet. Okay, so as I said, G1 are these sort of surface features. Uh, features like how popular is this entity on Wikipedia in the first place? Um, is there overlap in the name of the Wikipedia page versus the string in the text? Sort of surface features like that. Um, and so then G2 captures the piece that we're adding here. Um, so in particular, um, we're gonna look at two bilinear products. That's sort of the key of the model. I have an embedding for the authors, and that's an embedding that I compute um, from the position of, of each individual in the social network. So you've um, maybe heard of this idea of embedding nodes in social networks to sort of represent positions um, in the network where, where two nodes will have similar vector embeddings if they're in similar parts of the network. Um, so we just run that sort of off the shelf to get embeddings of each author. Um, we get embeddings of the entity as well. That's this V sub Y, and that's um, a method that you could apply as well to knowledge bases to get embeddings of entities. And then what the model is gonna learn are these inner matrices, W, um, that allow us to build these bilinear products. And so the, those matrices essentially capture the compatibility first of, of the text and the entity, um, and then of the author and the entity. So the fact that this guy likes to talk about basketball-related topics would somehow be captured um, by this matrix W. And so we'll backpropagate into that to learn that. And the training that we apply here is, um, is sort of a, 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 a SVN, sort of support vector machine style training um, algorithm, loss augmented training. What we do is we're gonna, we're gonna look for um, hypotheses, so possible entity labels um, that, are, that are strong, so get a high score according to our current model, um, but wrong, have a high error term. We're gonna penalize those guys in particular, get a gradient on the parameters to move our model away from those guys. So we don't wanna just move away from wrong answers, we wanna move away from wrong answers that our model likes. Um, and that's the idea that underlies support vector machines. Um, and then once we have that, that, that objective, we can get gradients on that objective and just do stochastic gradient descent to learn all the parameters. Okay, one sort of final piece about this problem, sort of a nice, I think, interesting NLP piece or algorithmic piece, is that you know, we have the text, we can break the text up into tokens, um, but um, references to entities are not guaranteed to be single tokens. So you can refer to an entity like Red Sox or like the Golden State Warriors with a span of tokens rather than a single token. Um, and there's a constraint, which is that once I decide that a token is part of a reference to some entity, um, I don't want to reuse it as referring to some other entity. So in particular, you know, you could write Sox alone, and that could be referring to, to some entity. But if I'm going to use Red Sox, the substring, as a reference to this entity, um, then um, I can't reuse Sox as well to refer to something else. Um, and so that's a, that's a constraint that we have to apply and we need techniques from structure prediction essentially to enforce that constraint. So once I've sort of used a token to, to refer to some entity, it's gotta be nil for all other entities. Okay, so um, SMART was the system from Microsoft Research that was the, the state of the art before we did this research. We collaborated with the author from SMART so we guaranteed we could do better and not hurt anybody's feelings. Um, you can build a, a, a straightforward classifier um, using um, just these sort of surface features, and that does okay. Um, structure prediction is really important, so this, this, this point about not reusing tokens to refer to multiple entities, um, you get a big boost from that, but um, incorporating this sort of social information as well um, is also a key step, and that gives us significant improvements over the prior state of the art. And this is on a task of, uh, of, of entity linking on Twitter. Okay, so that's... Um, this first point that I wanted to make about um, tacit assumptions about audience knowledge, um, I want to move to the second point about language variation across groups. And what I mean by that is people using language differently. So in particular, um, you know, here's uh, in a simpler time in American politics. This is former Congressman Charles Rangel. He says, I would like to believe he's sick rather than just mean and evil. Who's he talking about? I don't remember this quote. I thought this quote was great at the time. This is former Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, uh, sick, typically used negatively, um, but uh, pop sensation Taylor Swift, you could have been getting down to the sick beat, obviously, maybe not obviously, I think obviously <laughs> means it positively in this case. So, um, you know, something as simple as sentiment analysis, uh, we need to know who's talking to know what they mean. 
Um, so really what we'd like, if we think about this probabilistically now, I want to get a probability over a label, like positive sentiment or negative sentiment, condition on the text, but I also want a condition on the author. Right? So ideally I would get personalization. I would get a different classifier, a different sentiment analyzer for, for everyone. Oh, you know, Taylor Swift said this, does that mean she's happy or sad? Charles Rangel said this, does this mean he likes Dick Cheney or doesn't like Dick Cheney? Um, so I, you know, I'd really like to get that sort of personalization. And you know, of course, for speech recognition to be really, really good, you know, personalized systems are what people use. Um, but I can't imagine that I'm going to get labeled data on Twitter for every possible person whose sentiment I want to analyze, or more generally, whose documents I want to classify. Right? So that's the issue. I'm not going to go label data for every possible author, yet I want a system that's personalized per author. Um, so we're going to approach this with an ensemble learning sort of technique. I'm going to imagine I have like, like a set of like k different basis models. Um, and each author gets some, each basis model gives me a distribution over labels condition on text. Um, each author gives me a distribution over basis models. And I somehow have to learn which basis model to put authors into um, without necessarily having labeled data for every author. Um, so again, we're going to use this idea of homophily again in this case. And so imagine, you know, I have labeled data for Charles Rangel, I have labeled data for Taylor Swift, um, but I don't have labeled data for like Nancy Pelosi and young Justin Timberlake here. Um, but if I had to make a guess, like I'm going to guess, like just, you know, if this is my social network, the edges indicate a social network, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that Pelosi's language is closer to Rangel's than to, to Taylor Swift's. And I'm going to guess that Justin Timberlake's language is closer to Taylor Swift's than it is to Rangel. And so, again, we're going to use this idea of homophily um, to try to move forward. Um, so you could ask, like, you know, is, is this actually, is this something actually valid? Um, so, you know, is there, so homophily in terms of what topics you talk about, perhaps not so surprising. Um, homophily in terms of linguistic style, that's a question. And, and so what we, we try to measure here is whether, you know, if I have a classifier that makes a, an accurate decision for you, is it more likely to make an accurate decision for your friends? And if it makes an inaccurate decision for you, is it more likely to make an inaccurate decision for your friends? So, so we can't really measure sort of style across the network, um, but we can measure whether the, the, the sort of success of the classifier um, is assortative on the social network. So, so, so is, is, is smooth across the social network. Um, and we measure this by, by, by first computing a statistic like this, which just shows how often a classifier is either right for both people in a friendship or wrong for both people in a friendship. And then we compare that with a, with a random baseline where I start randomly permuting the labels that the classifier assigns. And so you know, the gap is not like, huge in each of these cases. Again, three different networks I could construct from Twitter. Um, but in, you know, in each case, um, you have more similarity in the real network than you do in these randomly rewired networks. Okay, so um, again, we use this idea of node embeddings to, 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 to sort of operationalize this idea of the social network structure. So social networks are these sort of complex relational objects. Node embeddings allow us to sort of compress those objects into vector representations um, for each individual. So imagine that each author, each person on Twitter, I get some vector representation for them. And the key thing is that I don't need any labeled data to get that representation, right? I get this vector just by knowing who you're friends with or who you follow or who you retweet. Um, so from that vector representation, E sub A, um, I pass that through a feed-forward neural network, um, and, and ultimately the output of that is a softmax layer that gives me my distribution over the ensemble, um, over the basis models in my ensemble. Um, so for each author, I get a weighting on different basis models. I'll show you the basis models. This is the last slide. I'll show you what the basis models are. Um, and, then, and then my probability um, is a weighted sum over those basis models. So you imagine I'm learning like k different sort of classifiers, one for each of k different linguistic styles, and I'm going to try to guess what style you're going to use based on where you are in the network. Okay, and so we apply this to, to Twitter sentiment analysis. We actually also apply it to um, a totally different domain of product reviews where the social network is constructed by who trusts who. So you're allowed to declare that I trust this person's reviews in this network. Um, and in both cases, you get a, you get a substantial improvement um, over a, a version of really the same model that doesn't get to look at the social network structure. So the social network structure really seems to sort of drive um, an improvement. Um, but what I really wanted to show, I really wanted to get to these basis models. So you can, you can really, even with just five different basis models, um, you can really see a lot of different styles with respect to sentiment. So, you know, you have, I think, like people that, that use like swear words, but in a positive way. So this is like one group of people. Um, 
Uh, you have like another group of people, like more sarcasm, I guess, that use kind of laughing words, but in a negative way. So that when, they, when, when they want to say something negative, they indicate kind of sarcastic laughter. Um, we do get the sick example as positive in one of the basis models, so I was excited to see that. Um, and then um, I think like the very last one are people that just, just really don't like uh, fans of like teen celebrities. And so that's sort of, it's not really like what we wanted to capture, but I guess, you know, for those people that really is very negative. Um, so a little bit of topic creeping in there as well, but mostly linguistic style. Okay, so, so just to wrap up, um, I think, you know, robustness, uh, especially robustness to new domains, to variation, that's really the key challenge for making natural language processing effective um, in social media data and really to, to, to all domains outside of, you know, where, where most of the labeled data comes from, which is news text. Um, the two things that I think make that difficult, one are tacit assumptions about what the audience knows, which you know, journalists are sort of trained not to make, um, but the rest of us make freely, and that really sort of facilitates communication. Um, and the second thing is, is language variation. So people want to use all kinds of writing styles, and NLP has to work for all of them. Um, and so in this talk, I focused on using so social metadata, which in, in, in places like Twitter we can get, um, to, to handle both of these problems. Um, I'll say a little bit about other work that we're doing in, the, in, in my research group at Georgia Tech. Um, I think the other sort of big challenge for language in any domain is the long tail. So um, no matter how big your corpus is, you're going to encounter words, certainly phrases, sentences that you've never encountered before when you get to test data. Um, and so you have to somehow um, do intelligent things on these sort of long tail phenomena. Um, so we have you know, recent research on things like embeddings for words that you've never seen before, learning to predict what a word embedding would be from the, um, the characters in the word. Um, so that was actually, Yuval just presented that last week. Um, uh, Lexicon-based supervision techniques, so taking things like lexicons that are associated with different labels, um, but now sort of going beyond that and applying um, an unsupervised machine learning approach so you can learn weights on each word in the lexicon. Um, and I've recently been moving into this domain of electronic health records, um, which pose, I think, a lot of also, you know, interesting problems, um, similar in some ways to social media. Okay, so thanks for listening. I guess it's a coffee break. I want to say especially thanks to my student, Yi Yang, who uh, was the main guy for both of these projects. He's now a data sci uh, research scientist at Bloomberg. Um, we also did the work with Mingwei Chang, and it was supported by the NSF, uh, NIH, and, and, and Georgia Tech. Thank you.